بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to Fiqh of Hadith class We've reached Hadith number 67 and we're still in the book of prayer In this Hadith narrated Ibn Umar رضي الله عنهما The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم used to offer prayers on his rahila facing its direction by signals but not the compulsory prayer he also used to pray with her on his rahila that's what Ibn Umar said he used to offer prayers what kind of prayers it is explained by the end of the hadith not the compulsory so it is the optional prayers what's the meaning of rahila on his rahila on his mount be it a camel, be it a horse, whatever he rides. What do we learn from this hadith? There are many lessons in this hadith. You can pray a voluntary prayer on uh, mounts. You could pray a voluntary prayer on mounts. What's the big deal about praying optional prayer on mount? Can't you pray obligatory prayers on mount also? No, you have to be facing. No? If you are in the plane, can you or can't you? You can't understand. So what's the difference then? You can't stand on the mount. Again, be specific. What's the benefit here? What's the lesson that is learned? What? Exactly, because can't he just step down and, and pray? So is it permissible to do the same with the uh, obligatory? Okay, so we learn from this that although it is possible that you are able to stop and go down, you still can pray the optional <coughs> prayer on on the mount, on the rahila. We learn from this there is difference between what is obligatory and what is optional. Because can you do that with the obligatory prayer if you have an option? If you can dismount, do we tell you go ahead and just keep going or you have to go down? and pray. Standing is a, is, is a pillar of prayer or not? Yes. yes. If it's a pillar, then wouldn't the prayer be invalid if you are able to, to stand and you did not? If it's obligatory. So again, there is difference between the what is obligatory and what is optional. Same thing with what? Qibla. The Qibla. What's the ruling on facing the Qibla? It is obligatory, but not in the optional prayer. So in the voluntary prayer, in traveling, it is permissible not to face the Qibla. Again, the same thing, we learn that the optional prayer is different than the obligatory prayer. What did he use to perform, the Messenger وسلم, in addition to the optional prayers? Witter. What do we learn from this? Is witter obligatory or optional? This hadith is clear evidence that witter prayer is what? Optional. Okay, if we say optional prayer is different than the obligatory prayer, to what extent? Now you have two important things of the prayer, which is what? Standing and facing the Qibla. What about wudu? Someone says, uh, optional prayer is different than obligatory prayer, so I don't have to perform wudu. These are the only exceptions. These are the only exceptions. These are concessions, so you need an evidence for, for any other concession. What about food and drink? You used to do what? Drink. You are praying, so. Hold on a second, and you eat. 
not eat what? Why not eat? Can you drink? Why? You can eat and drink if it's for the benefit of the prayer. For the, how it is for the benefit of prayer to it's eat? You Unless you are, you are thinking. It will help you focus and you know, if you're going to be more focused, it will help you give more strength. Yeah, sure. Khushu? Khushu, it's better not to pray. You finish your, your, your food and then you pray. If you, are, if you want to wake up, you sleep, and once you wake up, you pray. You don't, just like uh, when the Prophet ﷺ saw a robe tied in the masjid, then he asked for whom this robe was. So, can you eat and drink? Yeah. So then you, so you're not obviously hungry, and then you start praying. You're praying, and then you became hungry or thirsty, and so to continue that without breaking it. You know, it's a small step for. So, so we say now, why, why you can drink based on the need? Abdullah ibn Zubair radiallahu anhu, he used to pray in Mecca, and the birds used to come, thinking that it is a pillar. Imagine for how long do you have to stand until birds come and stand on your shoulders? So. Based on the need, the same thing here. Why the Prophet ﷺ prayed over the mount? Again, the mount is moving. So, he needed that. Unless he has to stop and he goes down and he prays and he stops the traveling. So, because he's traveling, he needs this. So, based on the need, whatever you need to do, it is permissible. And the nawafil, the optional prayer, are not as strict as the obligatory prayer. But we don't say... You don't have to perform wudu, you don't have to do this. Anything that is prerequisite for the obligatory prayer, by default, it is also prerequisite for optional prayer, unless there is an evidence. And if you look at all these things, the common thing is the need. Standing and riding. The next hadith, Again, Ibn Umar narrated, while the people were offering the Fajr prayer at Quba, Quba, as we know, in the southern part of Medina, closer to Mecca, people were praying there. Someone came to them and said, it has been revealed to Allah's Messenger وسلم, tonight, and he has been ordered to pray facing the Kaaba. So turn your faces to the Kaaba. Those people were facing Asham, Jerusalem. So they turned their faces <coughs> towards Kaaba. This is the famous story when the people were facing the Kaaba. Uh, the, uh, Sham, and again between Asham and Mecca, it is two opposite directions. It is not uh, north and northeast, or south and southwest. It is north and south. Asham in the north, Mecca is in the south. So they were facing north. Ibn Umar says, while the people were offering the Fajr prayer at Quba. Someone came to them of the companions and told them it has been revealed to Allah's Messenger وسلم, tonight. So last night, in the night, because they are praying Fajr, it has been revealed. And he has been ordered to pray facing the Kaaba. So turn your faces to the Kaaba. That's what the man told them. What did they do? They turn first their faces. What do you learn from this? Exactly. Is this a minor issue facing the, the, the Qibla, the direction of Muslims, or it is important issue? Something that you do five times a day. Can you rely on the report of one person, solitary report? This hadith is clear evidence that yes. 
Why? Because the people did not tell him, who are you? Wait until we verify. This is a clear evidence that you accept the solitary narrations in regards to the matters of religion. Also, it shows you how the companions were submissive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How they responded to the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How they followed the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They did not say or give any excuse. Let's wait, let's confirm. We, we're not sure. It is hard. During the prayer, again imagine if you are in the opposite direction and you move all the way. That's what happens to the believer. When he's used, he's just waiting to adhere. Whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Messenger وسلم, say, they will do. They are ready. They are just waiting for the commands. And look at the companions also. How they used to help each other. The night the ayah was revealed, the same time this man came and told them, he did not sit and watch them and then tell them, you know what, I think you have to repeat your prayer. Or he started chit-chatting with them. They care about what is important. They enjoy good. They help each other. Now the issue of the Qibla, we know the story behind it. The Prophet ﷺ prayed for 16 months or 17 months facing a sham. Then he faced the Kaaba. Why do you face the Kaaba? Hmm? Because Allah commanded us. Didn't Allah also command us to face a sham? He changed. So one of them has to be bad. None of them is bad. Then why not from the beginning we are told to face the Kaaba? It is a test. So, we are Muslims and the meaning of Islam is to submit. Allah tells us to face Al-Sham, we face Al-Sham. Allah tells us to face Al-Kaaba, we face Al-Kaaba. It is not because Al-Kaaba the most beloved place to Allah. Yes, it is. But if that's the reason, then it had to be the Kaaba, the Qibla, the direction from the beginning. And it was not. So, it is submission. It is submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is not east or west. Whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to do, that's what we do. The next hadith, narrated Anas radiallahu an, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, straighten your rows as the straightening of rows is essential for a perfect and correct prayer. سَوُوا صُفُوفَكُمْ فَإِنَّ تَسْوِيَةَ الصُّفُوفِ مِنْ إِقَامَةِ الصَّلَةِ And in the other narration, مِنْ تَمَامِ الصَّلَةِ The prayer in Jama'ah is very significant. And the way we pray also is very significant. No one else does what Muslims do. Now, non-Muslims, they may have larger gatherings, sometimes. But no one has more than 2 million people in one place at the same time every year. How do we stand in prayer? Feet to feet, foot to foot, and shoulder to shoulder. That's how we stand. It is not like we're sitting on chairs and then there are VIP elite and then you have coach, <laughs> regular people. We are all sitting next to each other. The way we stand, how do we stand? The Prophet ﷺ said, straighten your rows. It has to be straight. And that's the job of the Imam. Unfortunately, many times you find the Imam, he came and he just, he may say it, he doesn't look, he's saying it and he doesn't see what's going on, maybe this, the line is not straight, and he just starts the prayer. 
It is the job of the Imam. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ says it is for the perfection of the prayer. Which means if the line is not straight, would the prayer be perfect? No. No matter how much khushu, no matter how nice and beautiful was the voice, in the, it is not perfect. It is essential for the perfection of the prayer. And that's why the Messenger ﷺ used to do that himself. He used to say it and he used to do it with his hands. <coughs> so the Muslims are like one body. It is a reflection of our nearness to each other. We are straight. So the rich is not in the front. He is one step or one inch. And the poor is one step behind. The one who has legal documents and the one who is immigrant. And we don't have any, anything like that. We are Muslims, so we stand next to each other. We stand in straight row. Now, it is also the job of the followers. Because if you know that this is part of the perfect, perfection of the prayer, and if it was not done, the prayer is not perfect, you have to work hard on perfecting your prayer. How do you do that? You look on your right and you look on your left. And believe me, if everyone did that, the prayer, all the rows will be perfect and straight. But the problem people, they just come and wait. Look to your right and look to your left. Is the row straight or no? It is for the perfection of the prayer. So it is not enough to have good wudu. It is not enough to come to the masjid early. And that's by itself is a lesson for us, that we are together, we complete each other. You cannot do everything yourself. No matter how excellent you did your wudu, no matter how early you came to the masjid, everyone else has to help. See how significant and important is this. The next hadith. Narrated an Nu'man ibn Bashir, radiallahu an, the Prophet sallallahu said, Straighten your rows, لَتُسَوُّنَّ صُفُوفَكُمْ أَوْ لَيُخَالِفَنَّ اللَّهُ بَيْنَ وُجُوهِكُمْ Straighten your rows, or Allah will alter your faces. What does that mean? Allah will alter your faces. Now, if the Imam said that, what will happen to him? <laughs> they will alter his face, right? Actually, I may do it tonight, inshallah. Because I, I've never heard it before, uh, any Imam do it. And sometimes, now, when the Prophet ﷺ said this, again, if you repeat it always and you still find people not doing that, you have to... to uh, to be firm with them. What will happen? Now you ask yourself, why we are divided? This is one of the reasons. Because the way we pray. If I'm not patient with you, if I don't have the patience to look and straighten the raw, our hearts are different. And the same thing in our actions. So we're divided. The Prophet is saying, your faces will be altered. What does it mean? What does it mean? Have you ever saw someone with his face altered? Hmm? Like how? How? It will be changed. Didn't it come in another hadith that doesn't he fear the one who raises his head before the Imam that Allah will like donkey? How, how it is possible? It could be possible physically on the day of judgment. Or will alter your face the way it looks. 
not necessarily physically, but the, the light and the darkness that is in the face. Many times you, you tell the person, you know what, I could tell from your face what's going on. So again, imagine if someone every day, he doesn't care about straightening drawers. And if people told him, he ignores that. And the other one, every single prayer, he is trying to make sure that the prayer is full, is perfect, and the line is straight. The next hadith, Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anh said, my grandmother Mulaika invited Allah's Messenger وسلم, for a meal which she herself had prepared. He ate from it and said, Get up, I will lead you in the prayer. Anas added, I took my hasir, the mat, washed it with water as it had become dark because of long usage and Allah's Apostle stood on it. The orphan and I aligned behind him, and the old lady stood behind us. Allah's Apostle led us in the prayer and offered two rak'ah and then left. This is beautiful hadith from Anas ibn Malik. Anh. He says, My grandmother invited Allah's Messenger وسلم, for a meal, which she herself had prepared. Can a woman invite a man for a meal? It's a grandmother. What about the Prophet ﷺ? Wasn't he a grandfather? <laughs> this is the Prophet ﷺ. So it is uh, exception. Yeah. exception. Uh, can a woman invite a man? Yes. It's an honor to invite the Prophet. Hmm? It's an honor to invite the Prophet. It is an honor to invite. Her grandson is a servant of the Prophet. Yeah. Well, the, the, there is difference when you say you can and when you say it is an exception and when you say they were not alone. Which one is the correct one? It is an exception. No, no. no. If you say it is an exception, you need an evidence. This is just What's the evidence? <laughs> so every action the Prophet ﷺ does, we don't do because he's the Prophet ﷺ. That does not make it halal either. We don't deduce laws from your mother's friend, <laughs> no, your friend's mother. <laughs> yeah, current situation does not make uh, unlawful things lawful. We, we're, we're trying to deduce the law from the hadith now. This is the hadith. Is it permissible or not permissible? Or it depends on who's the one who's invited. So it is a specific case, or it is general, but with restrictions, if they are righteous, or what is it? That's what we need to know. Yeah, That's what why is it wrong? What's the proof that it might be wrong? General. What's the proof? I mean, There's a general one, right? It's the, just having a, a woman and a man on the That's general. Okay, that's a different issue, when, when they are alone. Now, we're not saying it is khalwa. This is not khalwa. This is not seclusion, because there are two people in addition to this woman. If that's the case, is it permissible? Why? Okay. Present uh, present your evidence why it is haram. What if they were mahrams? That's different, right? Also, it's different. Well, here, here's the case. That's what we're talking about if now. If he's a, if, if he's a mahram of her, then that's fine, obviously, right? It is fine? If it's mahram. Wait, so so would you, if, if you have a wife, would you allow your wife to invite a stranger man? No. It's not without your permission. Oh, yeah. What if with your permission? What if with your permission? She told you, I want to invite him. 
would you would you allow this or would that be permissible now here why the woman invited the man couldn't Anas radiallahu an okay what if she wanted to invite him why didn't she tell Anas Anas radiallahu an says my grandmother invited him she's making the meal and she prepared the meal herself Anas was very little it shows the love of course, because the Prophet ﷺ is blessing. That's and again, he came not only to eat the food. He, he is he in need of the food. Wouldn't it be the duty of the Messenger ﷺ to tell her? In other situations, it is haram, but because I am the Prophet of Allah, this is halal. No. no. So. But he is not mahram to them. So <coughs> can you invite, can you do that? Yes, yes. Your sister, you are present. She invited someone from the community. Is that permissible? Yes. yes. Why? You're present. Yeah, and you're present. But he is not, he's not relative. Because this hadith. Yes. Why is it haram? Why it is haram? That's the question. Is there any reason it is haram? From this hadith? Why it is not allowed? Okay, let's let let's leave this issue aside. Now, when the Prophet ﷺ came, he ate from it. From what? From that meal. Now, were they rich people? Anas and his grandmother? No, because obviously not. And not only that, Anas said, "I took the mat and what? Washed it. Why?" Just that. Did the Prophet ﷺ tell him, what is this? I am the messenger of Allah. This is not appropriate for me. That's not my status. Look at the Prophet ﷺ, how humble he was to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How simple he was. That's the messenger of Allah sallallahu So the food, obviously it was not that fancy food. Yet the Prophet ﷺ ate from it. And not only that, what did the Prophet ﷺ do? He asked them to get up. Why? So he, he will lead them in the prayer. Why he did that? Now she invited him for food, yet he did something in return. That's what the Muslim should do. Someone did something to you, you try to reward him. You try to do something, if you could. The Prophet wasallam ate from the food, and they were honored by having the Messenger wasallam. yet he wanted to reward them. He wanted to pray in their place because the prayer of the Prophet ﷺ is blessing. So he asked them to stand up. So whatever you could help your brother, you should do. You're invited to a meal, give a present, give something when you're coming. That's nice. Or say something nice. Compare this to other situations where you say, SubhanAllah, I don't like this food. They, they did not have, they were not prepared and you start complaining. You will never be like the Messenger ﷺ. Yet, look what he did. Try to show people appreciation. Even if you do not like it, at least, at least, they did their best. That's what they could do. And you're not blamed if you did your best. Prophet ﷺ stood on that dark mat after it was washed. He did not tell Anas, why didn't you do it before I came? I don't have time to be wasted until you wash it. Now, the main point in this hadith is about the position of the people behind the Imam. Where do they stand? The orphan, Damra, and Anas radiallahu an, where did they stand? <coughs> behind the Prophet sallallahu alayhi Who stand behind, who stood behind them? Mulaika radiallahu anha, the grandmother. So, where does the woman stand? The hmm? the back. back, behind. Why didn't she stand next to Anas? She is his grandmother. That's the position of the woman. Where does she stand? In the back. What if she is the spouse? Does she stand next to you or in the back? Are you sure? Yes, that's the position. 
That's the position of the woman. They stand in the back. Even if they were young, what about the uh, kids, males? Even if they are young, yes, that's the story. Anas radiallahu here, he was a teenager only. Yet, he stood behind the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa So, that's the position of the people following the imam. Last hadith, narrated Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma. I spent the night at my aunt's Maymuna, at my aunt's house. Maymuna bint al-Harith radiallahu anha. She is the wife of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu stood in the night praying, so I stood on his left, on his left side. But he took my head and put me on his right. This hadith is narrated by Ibn Abbas anhuma. He spent the night at his aunt's house, who was the wife of the Messenger Maymuna radiallahu anha bint al-Harith, she is the sister of Umm al-Fadl. Umm al-Fadl is the wife of al-Abbas, the father of Ibn Abbas anhu, Abdullah ibn Abbas anhu. So Ibn Abbas anhuma, where did he spend the night? At his aunt's house. Can you spend the night in your relative's house? Yes. yes, you can. Why did he do that? Obviously, the house of his aunt was not a palace for video games or for, for uh, TV or PlayStation. Why did he spend the night there? To observe the messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Look how smart and brilliant Abdullah bin Abbas was. He was observing. And again, look at him. He was a kid. At that time, he was very young. And usually kids, they are concerned about what? Playing games. But that's not what Ibn Abbas was concerned about. And that's why he was able to relate this hadith. He said the Prophet ﷺ stood in the night. Usually kids sleep early. Yet he was not asleep. He was awake. Observing the Messenger ﷺ. He stood on the left side. What did the Prophet ﷺ do? He put him on the right side. Again, this hadith, the main point here is about what? Position of the follower. Where do you stand if you are only alone with the Imam? Where do you stand? To his right. Do you step one inch behind one foot? It doesn't say this. You stand to his right. What if you stood on the left? What if, what if you were not moved? The Imam is very thin and tiny and the Ma'moon, mashallah, he is very... So the Imam feared that he may... So he did not do anything. Is the prayer valid? Yes or no? Exactly. If it was incorrect, he had to start to restart the salah. You cannot join the salah from the middle while the prayer was incorrect. You have to start correctly. It is permissible, but it is makruh. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ moved him. The Prophet ﷺ shows what is best. Okay. So we will stop here inshallah. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Muhammad wa sahbihi ajma'in.